So we are uh, very glad to have Simon Cronyot tell us today about sharp boundaries for the swampland. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be uh, speaking at this, uh, at this forum, as always. It's a pleasure to see all these familiar faces in the audience, too. Uh, so, so yeah, so today uh, we'll be talking about, about this topic. Uh, the goal is to, uh, the general, we put Swampland in the title because it's related to the general question of whether low energy effective field theories can not or cannot be UV completed according to some set of axioms for what we expect the UV completion to be, like respect causality and, and unitarity, things like that, okay? So, so, so the goal is to find some criteria that allows us to uh, determine when this or cannot be done. The criteria we're, we're going to consider in this talk are entirely related to the uh, 2 to 2 scattering. And well, the same is true tomorrow. Like there's no, uh, there's no grand plan to do like 2 to 3 and 2 to 4 and 2 to 5 uh, in the next days. Okay, so, so we're gonna be focusing on 2 to 2 for, for a little while. And, and, and the interesting thing is that there are a lot of theories that can be uh, uh, ruled out from 2 to 2 scattering. So, so today we're not going to do anything grand, like you know, ruling out the sitter space or things like this. But, but the idea is to get sharp boundaries, to get at least sharp inequalities that UV completions have to satisfy. Okay, I'm going to give some some examples of. Uh, so this business is not new. So, so for example, uh, it's been known for for some time since a famous paper. 2006, that uh, if, if your Lagrangian contain like, a, if you have a real scalar field and your Lagrangian contain the four derivative term like this with some coefficient I'm gonna call G2, then, then it is known that uh, this coefficient have to be positive. And yeah, so, so that G2 is positive and that, that if, you, if you don't have gravity, I will, I will come to that in a second. So, so there are much more uh, bounds of inequalities of this type that we'll uh, we'll discuss today. So, so another another type of inequality is we can show that uh, some. So this come from uh, last file. So we can you can find relations between couplings. So 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 if you had another term with six derivatives here, schematically d six. Phi four, and this G three term, third order in minus terms. This term here turns out that uh, it will satisfy. You can you can prove over bounds, like G two, in terms of so in the framework of today there will be some extra mass scale m that I will define momentarily. That's some UV cutoff of UV EFT. So it's the mass at which you have new states, and and can. By sharp bounds, I mean that we can get precise numbers in equations of this type. Okay, so the power of m out there by exactly as you'd expect by dimension analysis, and and yeah, so 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 yeah, yeah. And you also have strong coupling bounds. Things like g two itself cannot be much bigger than some some coefficient times the cutoff, uh, yeah, m to the d. The mass scale to the d, which is the, the correct units of g. So we have these types of bounds. The goal is to try to. The main goal is to try to Simon, discuss. Can, yes. Can Can I ask you a question? Since you mentioned this bound, this strong coupling bound on G two, I'm a bit puzzled because on the one hand you it's an upper bound, so G two is it goes if it gets close to one is strongly coupled, but on the other hand your derivation neglects self-interactions, right? Loops of this particle. Yeah, correct. Yeah, so, so it's a bit, yeah. Is, is this really a bound that we can, that can be improved to include loops or? Yeah, I think it will get improved when we include loops. In some sense, uh, it, in some sense, yeah, if, if you're saturating this bound, it means your self-interactions in the effective theory are strong at the cutoff. And what we will do in this case to neglect loops is we'll artificially lower the cutoff so that loops in the EFT remain small. But then we get an artificially smaller bound. So, so with your techniques, you might be able to get better bounds. 
Yeah. So can I ask a similar question? So would you say it's really a bound or it's a criterion for telling whether you are at weak coupling or not? Namely, if your theory, instead of three, like you are getting, you get five, uh, uh, you just yeah, say, the, okay, it's not weak coupling anymore. This particular bound on the last one is is more a, 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 some a criterion to tell you whether you're at weak coupling or not. The other ones are sharp bounds. That, yeah, uh, I agree. That One side, yes, but the other side, side is more yeah. like that, right? It's more like if yeah. you violate this, then you are not at weak coupling. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's important to, 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 to first see the definition of UV cutoff, then we can see how sharp these bounds are. Yeah, exactly. So the, the bounds the bounds on the weakly coupled uh, low energy physics are, are really uh, going to be really really sharp. Yeah, but but yeah. Uh, okay. So 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 what we want to do is we want to discuss the story when we have uh, when we have gravity. So what is the space of allowed couplings into the gravity? So 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 we're trying like it, this is bootstrap talk. So we're trying to do is trying to carve out the allowed space of couplings hoping that there are some interesting kinks and cusps and features that, that represent interesting theory. So we're going to map them out. And, and to do that, we really need sharp boundaries. OK, that's the first step. So, so the question is, yeah, what's the space of our couplings once we have gravity? Uh, the short message to summarize this talk is that uh, to get those, the message is going to be that uh, Many of these bounds here that I describe were based on discussing forward limits. So as we'll review in a second, positive of G2, you can prove by writing a dispersion of relation in the forward limit and, and, and writing G2 as the integral of something positive. The main message of today would be that if you want to extend this toward gravity, or I think more generally toward loop level, just forget forward limits. There's a going to give you a way to technique to avoid using forward limits at all. And instead, we'll be localizing to short impact parameter. Okay. So the main that's the main uh, new thing we'll introduce today. Okay. So that's uh, that that's going to allow us to put uh, value of g in this uh, yeah, g newton into these these equations. Okay, you s explain why why it's non-trivial. So 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 here's the plan. So I tell you about the setup. Uh, I tell you about uh, and then that should take most of the talk, and tell you some results, and plots and open questions. So uh, there's a lot of papers uh, that. Uh, lately and in the past 15 years that I've worked on this topic. So I'm not going to give extensive references during the talk. So it is just a few, but there are, there are many more. Uh, topic. I'll be specifically talking about, about our work from a few weeks ago, 2102 point something. The, uh, I will not, one advantage of uh, omitting references during the talk is that uh, there's been some ideas in this field that uh, that look like good idea, but turned out to be wrong. So, so I'll be able to like mention wrong ideas without shaming anyone because they look good. Like they could have been good ideas, but okay. But so I can uh, I can be very uh, candid. Okay. The main thing about uh, as we've seen from the questions, the two questions have been asked already. The main question before we start bounding anything is we need to answer what do we bound? Okay, defining what we bound is, is not uh, is not trivial. Okay, so in our paper we 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 assume effective theory at three level and so on. But here I want to discuss carefully exactly what what you will do when you include loops and everything. Okay, what do we bound? Okay, if uh, if you're discussing with uh, maybe an effective field theorist or, or an experimentalist, people might want you to bound couplings in Lagrangian. Okay, that's something someone might like expect you to do. But like, we don't bound that. That's not what we bound. What we bound are observables. physical observables, and specifically uh, in, with the method I'll describe today, we bound observables that are linear in the S matrix. Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> and I've just, uh, I, I'll just just call attention to the fact that the map between couplings and observables is a nonlinear map. OK, <laughs> when you include loops. So, so, so obviously, uh, we don't directly bound couplings. OK, just, just to make that clear. We bound observables that we're going to tune so that they're picking up their, their most, sorry, the IS sensitivity is to certain couplings at three levels. OK, but it's hard to define really the problem. What do you want? What does it mean to bound the EFT couplings at loop level? It really, it's really hard to define this problem because fundamentally we bound observables. And as you know, the, the, you have to do perspective calculations often to relate. Even if the effective theory is weakly coupled, you may have to do a perspective calculation to relate it to observables. OK, so, so keep that in mind. Uh, the, uh, before I describe the specific observers we bound, I need to tell you about the axioms we use. So, so, so we'll be looking at observables that are, we'll be bounding observables then they are on the S matrix for S matrices that, that satisfy a certain axiom. As I said, we're just looking at two to two. One main axiom is that uh, Unitarity for us is just going to be some some positive con condition. So so in positive region, so in physical region, in the physical region, we assume that there's a partial wave expansion that converge, usual usual thing. So amplitude scattering amplitude two 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 amplitude is a function of s and t, s t. And, and so we can write a partial wave expansion for it. Some over, over our spins of some numerical coefficients. It's positive times some Bergen polynomial of the scattering angle, something like one over two S, sorry, two T over S. times a uh, coefficient ag of s square which is the uh, the, the the theory dependent uh, information in in our method we're only going to use the imaginary part of this equation and we're going to use specifically that the imaginary part in some appropriate normalization is a number between zero and two. And today we'll mostly be looking for implications of the zero on the left. And the zero on the right is like a strong coupling, or like the strong coupling bounds that we'll not discuss today. Okay. So we, and we're only going to use this, uh, this for energies above the cutoff. So we assume that the energy, we're assuming that the theory is unitary. So the fact that it's positive here is, conservation of probability. So we assume unitarity. We assume that this is, we're only going to use this for S above a cutoff. Okay, capital M square. We're only going to use this actually there. And then we're trying to get implications for measurements at the scale N. Okay, for couplings defined at the scale N. So, so the other thing, uh, yeah. So the other axiom is analyticity. So ampl amplitude should be analytic in the upper half plane. Uh, we're going to fix actually the we're going to call the momentum transfer u in this talk because in bootstrap, uh, like s uh, crossing is supposed to exchange the s and t channels. So there's t channel, is s channel, and this crossing symmetry. That is a consequence of analyticity in the upper half plane. We're not going to care about the region near the center. So we only be working in this region there, basically. Okay, that's kind of tricky. Okay. So, so we only be working, we only need analyticity in this region. So in the center here, there can be crazy things on the thresholds. We don't care about it. We just we're just going to assume that for momentum transfers that don't grow faster than M. They 
and that is we have an editicity outside some circle of size n. That's our assumption. Yeah, I believe it's a very uh, robust assumption. So an editicity is at large enough. It actually doesn't quite follow from the theorems per prove in the 60s. Uh, people have shown that you have an editicity uh, at large enough s, but the way that s scales with t is uh, may not be uh, in, in, in the theorems. People did not really try to optimize that back then. So, but, but yeah, we assuming that is a key thing. And the other thing, an LST on itself, it's, it's, it's completely useless if you can't bound what happens at, uh, at high energy or the complex directions. So the, the last thing is, is bound in this. So essentially, these are all the ingredients of dispersion relations. So, so we're going to assume that specifically, this is really a key equation. We assume that as the energy goes to infinity, the amplitude it fix u divided by s square goes to zero. So amplitude cannot grow faster than s square. And this is going to be valid for u strictly less than zero. This is our key assumption. Uh, physically, so this, this assumption is very important. The s square is going to be significant. If it was s3, s4, it's, it's, it changes the story. So it, it's important that it's s square. The intuition for this behavior is, uh, the intuition is the, uh, so this is, we're going to be applying this to quantum gravity. Like if we want to apply this to quantum gravity, obviously we cannot use theorems from the 60s because we don't know what the axioms of quantum gravity are. So we have to make physical arguments. And if I want to sketch a physical argument for this, the intuition is you look at the impact parameter space. Or I will not, I, will not, I think I yeah, don't want to spend too much time on this. I've, I've given a lot of talk last semester and I feel I keep giving the same talk over and over again. So I, I want to skip that. But the intuition is that if you write m s u as, as a Fourier transform and impact parameter, u minus two b x of i b p, there's a factor of s that's kinematical in this transform, and and you have some amplitude that depends on the impact parameter, and and the idea is that uh, you have three factors here, and the idea is that this should, this thing should be bounded, and can give arguments why that should be bounded signal model, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so yeah, this causality should require that this is bounded. And then you try and you have to get some physical argument for how big how, how the area can increase with S. And, and then you have this factor of S. And, and the hypothesis is that when you combine all these factors, you get growth slower than S squared. Okay, that's the, uh, that's the idea of this. Okay, so I just wanted to motivate it, the S score somehow. And you can also look, for example, in string theory. In string theory, the uh, you have three-level string theory, you get S to the alpha prime uh, momentum transfer. So for with a plus two from graviton exchange. So so in string theory, this works, but just barely so. It works because of the uh, rigidization of the graviton. Okay, so. And notice that it doesn't work at u equals zero. It's really, it works strictly at non-zero momentum transfer. So this is what we use. Okay. Uh, so this, to, can, yeah. can I ask you, Simon? So, so this would be the analog of uh, the bound on chaos, right? For CFT. Ah, that's a good. Uh, that that's a good comment. Uh, I want to emphasize that this bound in this assumption is use an, an input. If you want to prove the bound of chaos in the context of scattering amplitude, this bound in this is, is an assumption of the boost of the bar. Uh, so this is this assumption is used to prove the bound of chaos. You, right. Using the bound of chaos, invoking the bound of chaos to argue this would be circular nonsense. Ah, this, sorry. Is, this is an assumption of the bound yeah, of chaos. This is, this is the non-perturbative bound uh, that, that you use to get yeah. the bound on chaos, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, right. so, so, yeah, this is important to, this is a very good question. Okay, thanks, Simon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a non perturbative bound, but it becomes S square in the end again, even though the non perturbative bound will be S to the one, but uh, it becomes S square again because uh, you have, uh, the, the free transform can grow here. 
going from impact to uh, going for, going from impact parameter to uh, to a momentum space is tricky, and and this is this is the part that so this is why it's a fixed argument that would be really nice to really flesh out in the paper. But but this is the assumption we make. Sorry, this comment about the bound on chaos was that in the dual CFT because that that bound is just proved. There's no assumption there. You mean the bound in chaos in the gravity theory? Yeah, exactly. In theory of quantum gravity. So maybe maybe just to situate in this. So the, this paper is is part of a series of work with uh, with friends working on CFT. So so this start, so last summer we wrote a paper. Uh, we wrote uh, a CFT version of, of these bounds, effectively of these of some rules, and within within the. Uh, uh, for gravity in ADS, this is a theorem, effectively. Okay. Okay. Effectively, uh, you can use that correlators are bounded and uh, uh, use the boundless property of correlator and start looking at uh, uh, scattering amplitudes that are. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, it takes some more steps to really convert this to a statement about scattering amplitudes, but but effectively, uh, uh, so this is work in progress. But we believe it's a in EDS you can take it for 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 your money. Uh, but let, let me just try to clarify. I'm not sure yeah. because there are two theorems, right, in CFT. One yeah. is just it's bounded because it's bounded by the Euclidean, and yes. then. It's it's the strong bound, and then from that theorem you prove the bound on chaos, which is also another theorem. Yeah. Which has to do with what we need is a strong one. And uh, yeah, so so that's like the power going like s square or like s. Yeah, so we need a strong one, but the strong one gets modified when you go from impact parameter to uh, to Fourier. But in 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 for CFTs in uh, sorry for gravity in ADS, this step doesn't matter so much. So <laughs> the main idea. Oh, let me step back a bit. The I'm phrasing this as a bound on momentum space, but at the end of the day, we the bound of, the method I would present today would we, we circle back to impact parameter space where the situation is much clearer. So, so when you apply the uh, boundedness of correlators to scattering processes, that it's a bit tricky how to localize an ADS without leaving the sheet where the boundedness is valid. So this is this is why this. This I have to leave to, or I will not discuss this until a paper is out that states out the detail, but we believe this can be done, okay? Sorry to so, so it, it, maybe it takes, I think the tease is tricky, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe it's clear to, to you, Joao, but of course, all of these are theorems in a guess, but now the story that, that we're, that Simone is discussing is in flat space. Is it clear to you that one can just take the limit of ADS to flat space and get this stronger bound? No, I don't think so. I think you have to worry about the order of limits. Yeah. But I mean, the, there yeah, is a, like yeah. Shiraz, Minual, and collaborators, they yeah. did write a paper about uh, yeah. trying to make that. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with, with that. So so this one has to be very careful about the order of limits. So I don't want to claim that it's a theorem now. I believe it. Morally, it should be probable using the boundedness, uh, the, the the strong property you mentioned. But dotting the T's is an important exercise that that we should do from our sort of perspective, position space, million, all that. It, it's important to do it. Yeah. And and right, going from flat space to desert to ADS would be interesting, and especially if we hope to use these ideas for desitter and so on in the future, where concept of S matrix really needs careful definition of what we will mean by an effective S matrix and so on. So the the air the just to move on to this talk, we're going to look we're going to use this property for scattering process that are that have small impact parameter. So let, let me explain uh, the the trick. Let me explain the idea as quickly as possible before we get lost in the details. So the idea is that first I will remind how the bounds on G2 is bounded, is, is obtained. The idea is you write some coupling you're interested in, like this coefficient of four derivative term I mentioned. And I'm gonna write the proxy for this coupling at the scale M by first I'm gonna, I'm gonna describe this without gravity. And then I will tell you 
but to add without gravity. Okay. Okay. So so we take this coupling that we want to bound, and the first thing is you write some observable the scale m that measures it. So the sort of observable we could do here. So G2 gave a term that's the that goes like S square in amplitude. So we can do an integral of ds over s cube over circle of radius uh, m of m s and zero momentum transfer. You could do something like this. So, so in the s plane, you do a circle like this, and this is m. And and this, then you deform the contour, and this convergence property that m over s square vanishes allows you to ignore arc at infinity and write this as the integral from uh, m square to infinity of ds over s cube of the imaginary part of m, which is positive. Okay, so we wrote g, g square. You wrote this definition of the coupling at the scale m as an integral over something at higher energies strictly high energies and therefore it follows that this is positive okay so this is a template for the sort of arguments we want to make notice that so you can ask yes. a question Go. why was the maybe you mentioned this already but why was this imaginary part of m positive ah uh it's because uh remember that we write uh the scattering amplitude, the, the, the S matrix is uh, always write as one plus uh, I times the connected part. And that in, uh, you can transform that to any basis you want, including for two to two amplitude and the angular momentum basis. And, and the fact that properties are conserved mean that S square is less than one. And from that you derive that uh, the imaginary part of this is between zero and two. Oh, I see. Thank you. Yeah. Good. And this is true in the angular momentum basis. It's not true in the momentum transfer basis, but what people have used in the past is the observation that at uh, zero impact parameter, all the legend polynomials are equal to one, which are positive. So, so, so we also have positivity in the forward limit. But I just told you that you cannot use the forward limit because the amplitude. Uh, it's just this integral is actually not expected to converge in the forward limit, and and, and when we have gravity, so so we're gonna have to go around that. So 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 let me explain. The next step is first let's look at this exact same sum rule I uh, described, like on this exact contour, but now let's keep let's keep the momentum transfer non-zero. Okay. So what you would get is and, and I'm going to keep on the left hand side. So if I if the momentum transfer is non-zero, then on the left hand side I can measure various coefficients and in particular they will be uh, gravity. So there'll be a term that's a pi g over minus u. They will be uh, this term here it's actually two g two then there's a minus g three u and then some g four u square some infinite series of junk that you measure when you keep the momentum transfer fixed. And this, yeah, this is the uh, this is the thing that you can still write as an integral over uh, amplitude. But now to really express it in terms of positive, you have to reintroduce a sum over spins and integral over the mass of the AV states. Infinity, dm. So of this unknown coefficient, numerical factors, unknown coefficient, times legend polynomial of one plus two u over m square, and then there's some factors of of uh, yeah m square plus u square, some factor like this. So, Simone, sorry, yes. can I ask you? So, the G2 that you wrote here is not the same as above. So, this looks like uh, yes. the couplings in the Lagrangian, in fact, that you want Great. to avoid. Can you yes. clarify yeah. this? Yes, yeah. So, here I'm, 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 here I'm going to restrict to three level for registration. Yes. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain exactly what changes in loops uh, in a moment, okay? I want to illustrate concretely. So, so if you evaluate the zest inside the tree level, you would get a series like that, okay? Okay, thank you for, for the question. And then this infinite series of junk is equal to this. And this is gonna be true for any u less than zero. So we have an infinite number of some rules that probe different linear combination of junk. And the problem is to use this sum rule to extract information. But so, so this is what we'll do. Roughly speaking, we'll take integrals. You notice that there's a pole u here. So loosely speaking, we'll take integrals from, so we're gonna call this uh, some rule C2. This is the IR contribution, and this is the UV contribution. And they are C2, the IR plus the UV have to give us zero. So, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take combination of these some rules from integral zero to M or integrated over momentum transfer times some wave function, u, u is minus p square, of course. And we're gonna choose this wave function properly so that we end up doing scattering that is localized in the back parameter space. And we're gonna be in the, we're also going to uh, have suitable positive state properties. Okay, so so the, the goal is going to be to choose this function p carefully. So so this is one of the one of the step. So step one, we have to uh, yeah. So let, let me let me let me write it in full uh, on the next uh, next page. This is what we do. Oh, I think I. Oh, sorry. Okay, just better in word. So step one, so integrate over P. Instead of expanding on the forward limit, we integrate over P. And, and the useful range of momentum transfer uh, range strictly below the cutoff, such that the cut remains in the physical region and we can use positive state properties. Integrate over P in an in interval uh, zero, to M, okay? So this is step one. So this gives us valid some rules, but these some rules detect that's sensitive to all effective theory coupling. Effectively, if even more so since we're integrating up the cut of M and we're thinking of uh, effective theory as an expansion in one over M, that looks like bad, okay? The second step is to get rid of all the dot, dot, dot. Like so, so, so just to show, just to remind you, so this uh, this sum rules here is a is a, this infinite series of of junk. Oops, series of junk, and like we have to get rid of this dot dot dot. Okay. So I'm gonna show you the trick for this. The okay, I don't have a lot of time, so I will just convince you that it's possible by the following way. So the idea is to use identities. So so the idea is, that, for example, we have to combine, okay, physically, the way that it works is that we have to combine dispersion relations in different channels. So we're gonna give two intuitions. One of them is that uh, if you look at the quotient of the next term here, the way it appears in the amplitude is, and basically has S4, or yeah, let me write it, uh, can, it goes like G S square plus T square plus U square square in the amplitude. You can measure it from, S square U square. And the fact you could measure it that way is what we is the reason it showed up in the uh, in the question of S square, but you can also measure it from the question of S4. And the fact that you can measure it in different ways is gonna help us. So we're gonna try it every time we see a coupling that's measured that way, we're gonna try to measure it the other way instead. And and that's going to uh, uh yeah. Well, if you measure it one way versus the other way, it sounds like you 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 learn you 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 gain nothing. But the interesting interesting thing is that the sum rule with higher powers of uh, of s themselves are like more subtracted sum rule that converge better. So the the convergence of these things is is automatically better. So the power counting is more manifest, and we'll just be able to drop these things. So in practice. What we use is, is effectively, it's equivalent to using 
dispersion relations in two different channels. So in the appendix of a paper in November with uh, Vincent, we explain how, how to do this. So it's equivalent to using uh, dispersion relation in different channels because we're using crossing symmetry, right? Okay. Low energy crossing symmetry. Right. So if you if you compute the dispersion relation for given S and T, give it you, you express the M2 that uh, some S and T that are uh, low energies, you can express it as a sum of Legend polynomials in one channel, like like this, divided by you know M square minus S roughly, and then some some other factors. And and if you compute it in the other direction, you get uh, get similar uh, things. So you get a density that zero is equal to this minus S and T exchange. And this is valid for S and T less than, than zero. Yeah, when the, both dispersion relations converge, okay? So, so the idea is by using identities like this, we can write couplings in a simpler in way and basically drop those. So the result of this exercise, the sort of expression you want to see is what we call improve some rules. So let me show you what they look like. So this improve some rule on the left hand side is going to only have a finite number of couplings. So you get precisely the following. So we have eliminated all the other all the everything from Everything that has a S4 or more we've eliminated, sorry, U4 or more you eliminated. So we have this, sorry, UQ, U square and higher. So we have this plus 2G2U minus G3U equal. So the left hand side is exact. And now it's going to be equal to an average that I, I could be past the average I have. It's the same as we had before. This thing here. Okay. Oops. This average, and now we've subtracted some stuff. So there is a uh, there is a add it here. There's some extra. So the formula is in the paper, but you have some. You say a score of m six. I'm just gonna write a few terms so that it looks uh, it looks. Uh, Form a square plus three u times derivative of Legend polynomial at one divided by m square plus u square, and then there's some other factors. Okay, so there's one other term that kind of looks like this. So at the cost of adding one term like this, we've managed to have an exact left hand side. So this we call the average of C2 and prove. It's an average, it's it's valid for any u less than zero, any momentum transfer. And it's uh, something that acts on the mass and spin on of heavy states. Okay, so the goal is to have this. So the goal is going to find can, can I ask you can I ask you something about this point? Yeah. Um since I mean it seems important because you have infinitely many terms. Yes. And you're, you're taking S and U uh size uh, close to m so all become important it's important is absolutely uh, some rule is accurate so yep. uh, i mean do you have an argument why for example loops at around m ah. will not spoil oh, yeah. it yeah yeah it is the right the right way to think about this is that on the right hand side you should average strictly over look strictly at the uv part of dispersion relation and and then what you get is not zero what you get is something that's EFT computable. Okay, so this is an exact statement. There's some average over stuff above M, which is computable in terms of stuff below M. It can be large. This is this effective theory computable part. If you have higher divergences, for example. Okay, before because we avoid the forward limit, and because we work at S of order M square. 
and for divergence will not play a role. Uh, there's there's something, some issues that occur in four dimensions. We can talk about that. Uh, okay. We'll mention those later. I thought but, you were doing a expansion around U. So in that you have the other one over U from gravity, then U, U squared this, and so on. This is not an expansion. This is an exact formula that we're going to uh, use at U not equal to zero. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we, maybe I can, I can ask a really we're not expanding on the forward limit. Yeah. Maybe I can ask a related question because in the paper you get this by some infinite sum over combination. Yeah. Can you can you get this just by smartly choosing the the original function you're doing the contour integral when you when you do the contour integral just just guess some function that selects yeah. The term? yeah 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 this we're thinking about this so this this b to improve is okay I think the the recipe for guessing this there are different ways so you can think of it using this dispersion relation or blah blah but yeah. The claim is that by you can construct functions that look like this. And what's special about this function is that in the tree level approximation, they zoom in on finitely many couplings. Okay? So loops affect the interpretations. Loops affect the interpretation between this. Uh, uh, what, whatever the, you, I mean, I, I could define, technically what we do is this. Technically what we do is we define the coupling G2 to be what is measured by this particular equation, okay? For a particular choice of U. So for example, here I have just three couplings on the left. So I could multiply the equation by U, take, take a, a combination of second and third derivative that kills G3 and capital G and pick my favorite value of u, which is, I don't know, uh, one GV. And, and that's the definition of G2. That, that's the definition of the cup in G2 we will bound with this sum rule. Okay, this is the sort of, you know, this is what we can bound with this method. How to convert these bounds to bounds and couplings that you may be interested in in some Lagrangian requires hard work that we're not gonna do. But but there's a way of defining couplings where it's clear what we're bounding. But if that's if that's the way you take, but why you could also say, I mean, let me just define uh, even the original formula without the subtraction form. Let me just define that it's equal to this. Yeah, uh, yeah, you can g uh, over u plus g two u minus g three u, and these are going to be my couplings. And why would this not work? This will work. So why do you have to subtract them? I don't understand. Oh no! Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, let me. So given that these couplings have some vague uh, kind of no, but, no, but I mean meaning, I can define whatever I want. Uh, let me just define the original equation. Those are going to be my couplings at one GV. Mm, yeah. No, 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 let, let me. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm no, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, no, no. I think. Uh, there are loop. There are loop corrections to the left here, because we use modulo. We use this EFT computable here. Is the point that you're assuming that the loop corrections are going to be small, even for u of order m squared? Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, so. So if the if the theory is strongly coupled to the cutoff immediately, well. The question is whether the EFT is strongly coupled to the cutoff. The, the new physics could be strongly coupled, but the question is whether the, the EFT just below the cutoff is strongly coupled or not. If it's strongly coupled and you have strong EFT loops, to apply these ideas, you will have to artificially lower your cutoff. That's the, that's the current limitation of what we do. Okay. okay. The... So, so, so let me let me state the the method very precisely. So, so I think so. All the ingredients are there. So we have these. So, so first we integrate over p instead of expanding around small momentum transfer, and the second is that we use these uh, improvement, and these improvements are designed to eliminate all the garbage at tree level accuracy, but of course at loop level they will they will not eliminate everything. So at the loop level, don't you have to worry about soft gravitons, or is that no? not in dimension higher than four? Okay. D equal four is special. Uh, 
uh, okay, so I think I've said now. Uh, so, so, so let me kind of state it uh, more more precisely, just just as a recipe. So the recipe is the following. So this is what we call the dual problem in, in bootstrap language. So, so, so what what we get is exclusion plots. So, so the recipe is that uh, we consider uh, we find we find function psi of p. So wave function, so that integral from zero to m dp psi of p times this c2 improve uh, some rule of, of of minus p square. So this this act as a function acting on S matrix, so that this is positive for all heavy states and and for all j. Okay, so we have. We find functionals that are positive on all heavy states. And then these functionals, just by definition, they give us uh, when we act on, on the S matrix. So the functionals satisfy that we can write uh, some higher contribution is equal to a functional on in the UV. And this is this is positive. Okay. So rigorously construct functionals that have a positive action above a certain scale. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Just to understand, do you need to impose uh, all these constraints for any j and for any m? Any yeah. m above the cutoff, yes, because we don't know the AV spec. We're trying, we're trying to be completely agnostic about the UV physics. No, but to get a rigorous bound, you need to impose for any spin and for any m. Correct. I see. Okay. Yeah, and, and this answers that uh, the right hand side is a sum of only real positive numbers, and therefore the left hand side is, is positive. Thank you. So that that's uh, okay. I'm, I have to stop soon. So this is what we do, uh, and then and then we there's a space of function here. So we take in practice we take polynomials, and then we optimize. So if we act on we optimize with respect to the action at three level. Level. So we optimize. So at three level, this functional here you could write given a given wave function psi would give you some alpha times a pi g over m square plus beta psi times g two plus gamma psi times g three. So any functional that's positive in the UV gives an inequality like this. And then we optimize. Then we find we normalize so that gamma psi equal zero, beta psi equal one. And then we get a bound that then we maximize alpha psi, for example, to get a bound of the type g2 greater than minus alpha psi times a pi g over m square. Okay. So what we can give you from the result of this exercise is what number sits in front of such bound. Okay. So so the fact that let me mention a bit the physics. So so the fact that uh, so the this form is expected. So 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 there's a simple way to understand the, this form. So so I told you before that G2 is positive without gravity. And this positivity is to do with not having time advance when you do scattering. What happens with gravity is that gravity gives you a time delay that you always have anyway. So so the a self-interaction is allowed to give you a little bit of time advance as long as it does not overcompensate the time delay that gravity gives you. So this is why you get, when you include gravity, what used to be a positive constraint is no longer a positive constraint. You just get an upper bound that is shifted. The origin is shifted by gravity. Okay? And combine, this is the criterion that you don't have time, uh, time advances. Okay? So, so this form was expected by, by, by arguments in, the, in, the, in many papers. And, but it's important that it, the result is not that G2 is just positive. So let me show some plot. So, okay, first we, uh, as a warm up, we, uh, if, you turn, if you turn out gravity, if you turn off gravity, you can reproduce all the bounds that you obtain from the forward limits. So, so, so what we learned from this exercise, so this is a plot from paper that we did in November uh, with Vincent, uh, where we studied the, uh, Bounds around the four using before limit, then you see that uh, 
the combining functionals that are derivative around the for so so using either basis of functional that are Taylor series around the forward limit or basis of functional that are these polynomials of P, then we throw these uh, functionals into SDPB, look for positive combinations, we get the exact same extrusion plot. Okay. And I'm not gonna describe so much the physics of these, these plots. One feature, as I said, okay, uh, G2 is positive. You see that you get two-sided bounds on- Is there some semi-definite programming involved or is it just linear programming? It's uh, semi-definite programming. Okay. Well, SDPB, whatever that does. SDPB <laughs> can solve anything, but could is the problem that they're solving, is it a linear programming problem or is it a semi-definite programming problem? It's, it's definitely linear. Okay, so it's, you don't have to use SDPB, it could probably then be done with like, for if somebody wants to repeat it, they don't have to use SDP. They could use mathematics as linear programming function, probably. Yeah, probably, but we're not able to do that. But uh, but but someone could maybe teach me how to use mathematics how to do it. But how do you impose positivity for? The yeah, this, yeah, this is actually very tricky. Uh, of us. Yes. So so for positivity, so so the feature of the so SDPB requires like polynomials, and this this bound there. And then when you integrate against, uh, so what we have to do is we, we take this function that, that you see here, we integrate it again, the polynomial wave function in, in P, and we get some analytic function of M and J. And then we have to impose that this function is analytic. So what we do is we discretize spin and we evaluate at a few, a few hundred thousands values of M and J. And in addition, there's asymptotic condition it turns out that if you scale up to very large m and very large j, the condition that uh, the function in the functional psi, so it's compact support in p, and it also has to be to have uh, it turns out it has to be uh, to be positive in the impact parameter space. So we impose this. Uh, so we're looking for a function with these combined properties. And and we can uh, the positivity and impact parameter space we, can, we impose uh, very carefully also. So this is the so our bounds come come from these things. Yeah. So to be nice, I mean our friends with ear talks where our friends describe ways to come make there there are nice theories in one dimension for making functions that are compact support in one space and positive in in, in the Fourier conjugate space. It'd be nice to have a theory like that in our dimensions that, that uh, but yeah, we're basically asking SDPB to do that for us. Okay, okay. and okay, one, just one uh, result I have here. I a question yeah. about the previous constraint that you mentioned that it's expected from, yes. you know, that time delay. Is there is there any argument, like classical argument that you change <laughs> background and like, I mean, is the coefficient something that can be seen by like some, that's an, experiment or is that's an interesting question. I don't know about the coefficient. So, so the fact that bounds of this type should exist was anticipated in some papers. But uh, the nice thing about, uh, so for example, the G2 greater than zero, you can also argue independently by showing that the IR effective theory would be a causal in some background scale. Exactly. Yes. Uh, these sort of arguments, we don't know how to systematize them and, and, and find optimal bounds that way. So, so we took the uh, this dispersion relation approach to this. This turned out to be easier. It, it'd be very nice to see if these bounds can be understood using uh, low energy tough experiments. Thanks. So point. Okay. Yeah. And okay. Maybe to just mention, even without gravity, there's one overall slogan that that's very simple: is that. Uh, all of the coefficients satisfy dimensionless and the scaling, right? We expect that if you were to integrate out a massive particle of spin zero, you'd expect coefficients to satisfy, I know, uh, like to, to scale like a, uh, like a, uh, uh, if you integrate out, you expect to scale like a geometric series. So the coefficient should go like a uh, uh, coefficient of some something of order k should go like m squared to the k times some order one number. And effectively, we do get two-sided bounds on all the coefficients that have the scaling. So, so, so dimensionless, dimensional analysis scaling is a theorem that is a consequence of causality.
is, is, is a theorem uh, when you have causality. At the moment, it's a theorem only proof for uh, a scalar spin zero, for identical scalars. You know, I'm not claiming it's a theorem. I'm not saying if you redo this analysis exactly in, uh, in a theory with gravity or with photons, you would be able to bound everything. There could be it could be that there are exceptions, but but yeah, for this theory of scalar, dimensional analysis scaling is a theorem. So causality implies dimensional analysis. It's just a remarkable fact. Okay, and one uh, one application of this, which was pointed out in a paper, not our paper, but in a sub the same time as us, is that this immediately rules out certain uh, low energy modification of gravity, where people were trying to fine tune this coefficient g two to zero and have some interesting physics out of g three. And now we have two-sided bound on the ratio G2 over G3 is, uh, is uh, sorry, G3 over G2 is bounded on, on both sides. So, so, so it's, it's impossible to get it in theory, it's impossible to UV complete. So we now know that. Okay. Well, it was already difficult, but, but now it's, it's really ruled out. Okay, so let me show. So what is new is that we can do is exclusion plus and gravity. Now on the, on the, on the axis, I'm gonna show this ratio of the G2 and G. So, so basically this plot includes the three couplings that we had in, uh, so far in the talk, G, G2, and G3. I'm showing you the allowed region. And as you see, okay, these are just different space-time dimensions. Let's focus on D equals six here. Uh, as you see, there's a tip on the left. So this is a lower bound I was mentioning. Sorry, yeah, the lower bound that G2 must be greater than, than some number like this, okay? So in particular, saying that G2 uh, would be positive is, is not true, okay? This cannot be derived from the from the axioms and you can even find examples, uh, theories which are on the left of, uh, of the origin, okay? So so what we see is, a, is basically a cone that starts from some tip and yeah, so that's one comment. So let me just, okay, before concluding, let me, let me make some comments. That, uh, yeah, there's an idea that, you know, has been used because what, what else can you do? Sometimes uh, there's an idea that uh, trying to apply uh, dispersion relation to M, to the amplitude minus the graviton pole, uh, this idea of just subtracting the graviton pole will tell you that uh, you will lead you to expect that G2 is positive and that's just wrong. Okay, and the reason this is wrong, of course, is that, uh, sorry, is that uh, M minus gravitation pole does not satisfy the axioms. Uh, the dispersion relation for, if the dispersion, if M satisfies the dispersion relation, then the amplitude minus the graviton pole cannot satisfy the dispersion dispersion. Okay, so, so don't do that. Now that we know how to not do or not do this, we don't. There's no reason to do it again. Uh, it's also it's also possible sometimes to make to get rid of the uh, graviton pole by making assumptions of the about the UV theory. Effectively, that has, that amounts to uh, like doing some subtractions. So so you could use so so you could use this satisfy dispersion relations. But subtractions are very dangerous in this game, right? But it's not it's not positive. So in string theory, in fact, like a type ten, uh, ten type two B theory here is actually the point here, the origin of this. So you might uh, you might be tempted to apply dispersion relation in this sort of argument to m minus m string, but the imaginary part of that is, is not uh, is not positive. So so the argument doesn't teach you anything, so, so, so don't do that. And you can also have used some, some stringy model or you can, you can make various assumptions, but you have to be very careful that you, uh, if you make assumptions about the UV, you have to be very careful that you're not basically getting out what you put in. So here we don't make any uh, air, so we don't make any assumption about the UV, okay? That's, that's the main progress that we can do in this talk. We can do, in fact, uh, like by assumptions, I mean, for example, you could assume that the graviton is on some rigid trajectory with some slope, or maybe you could assume that uh, uh, 
get uh, at large impact parameter, probably uh, the icon, probably the graviton exchange icon analysis, and that that will also uh, be consistent with unitarity. So we can add these assumptions if you want, but but please be very careful and make sure your uh, these assumptions are actually correct, right? Because because yeah, if we the, the game of bounding effective theory coefficients should not uh, require on, should not refer to UV assumptions. Okay, and now I'm done. Let me briefly mention about uh, something in four dimension. In four dimensions, uh, when you try to play this game in four dimensions, you find the following interesting problem that uh, <laughs> functions that are <laughs> Positive in uh, sorry function with that are positive in impact parameter space cannot converge when integrated against gravity. <laughs> so so no function does like this work. So so there's a we had a work around in the paper where we said that if you only impose positivity up to some large impact parameter where maybe you believe the answer, then you can get a bound which depend logarithmically on the cutoff. So you can get bounds that have a log of the uh, log of some cutoff. In the ADS CFT, of course, we'd expect that this uh, B max would become like the ADS radius, and this would be a, a rigorous bound. But we don't we don't know that yet. In the context of uh, in the context of for the uh, flat space, this B max should probably be the an impact parameter where you trust diagonal approximation to work or something like this, where you trust some model of the UV. Okay, and then one would have to really work out what uh, how this statement, this is the place where I trust the UV, trust, I trust my model, I'll turn into a bound. A lot of things, it's actually a lot of open questions that are interesting in four dimensions. Uh, so, so, so in short, we cannot, we'll, we'll most like to constrain four dimension theories, but we cannot do this now because of this higher divergence issue. And you know, there's a lot of progress in recent years in defining scattering amplitudes that are IR finite by dressing or blah blah blah. But uh, this may be a message to this community. Uh, we need to know uh, what axioms are satisfied by this dressed amplitude. Like, do they satisfy dispersion relations? Are they analytic? Are they Lorentz invariant? Are they? Uh, do, is their imaginary part positive? Until we know all that, we, we cannot use these beautiful dressed amplitudes. So, it, but but so so that's why all the bounds we record really uh, the sharp bounds are for uh, dimension higher than four at the moment. Yeah. So yeah. So so, so in summary, we can. Yeah. But, ah, and last one, one last bounds here. Yeah. Ah, in maximal supergravity, we try to play this game. So the sort of things we get are the uh, are bounds on weakly coupled string theory. So, so this is like the coefficient of R4 in the Lagrangian. And we can show that the coefficient of, we get an upper bound on the coefficient of R4 in units of the mass of the first stringy state. On the other hand, there's been very nice paper uh, recently. They've used the primal approach. So instead of ruling out theories, they rule in theories where they obtain the, uh, the lower bound that, that basically says that uh, you cannot suppress physics more than you cannot suppress derivative correction more than by the Planck scale. So okay, ultimately we hoping that the primal and dual approach converge to the same answers. And okay, first the next step is to try to each group should try to bound the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps we, perhaps we'll get there. <laughs> so so thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Um, are there any other questions? I have a couple of questions. To continue on this on this question. So, do you think your your method can be so? If you if you generalize to include loops, then maybe you can address exactly the the, the problem that we were trying to address at yeah. the final blank line. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's maybe possible. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, for us, including loop is just a, a, a shorthand for saying, uh, uh, for saying, take the cutoff to zero. And and some of, I mean, we, we can get bounds that are independent of the cutoff by taking certain special combinations. I mean, the cutoff is 
the cut, assuming a cutoff give us more results, but but I think this method will, even if you don't have a cutoff, I think this method will still give some results. What's interesting about this uh, particular observable alpha, as you know, is that it's independent of loop corrections because the, the, the branch cut is suppressed in the infrared. So it's a very clean observable. So, so usually the problem is that there's not that many observable that you can define at zero momentum. <laughs> But in 10D string theory, this is at least this observable you can define at zero momentum. So, so we'll be able to, I think, yeah, it would be nice to apply our method with the cutoff set to zero and, and, and see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's think about that, yeah, thanks. Yeah. I have another question. So um, how much do you think that uh, your bounds will depend on the real parts? Because right now you are uh, putting like two-sided bounds on the imaginary part, let's say. Yeah. But uh, what about the real parts? Do you think they will uh, mm -hmm. change a lot or uh, more or less they will? Uh... Yeah, well, our, our framework, our numerical framework, uh, allow, right now uses only functional that are linear in the S matrix. So, so usually the constraints on the real part of the amplitude is the square of the real part is somehow related to it's not an it's not a linear constraint. So we don't we don't quite know how to uh, to do this right now. We we're only looking at constraints that are linear in the S matrix. Yes. But you expect that the bounds will. Uh... Well, I can yeah, I I can tell you uh, it be I think that we this is probably one of the things we'd compare because with the primary approach you're putting all the nonlinearity and so uh, so I think it would be interesting to see if the problems really converge or not because we're technically looking at different problems. Yeah. Sure. Can I ask a, a question? So the, um... I mean, one of the so I want to ask about uh, one of the assumptions: the analyticity uh, with the small impact parameter they are using. So, um, so I mean, I'm familiar that usually you don't have analyticity if you have large T, right? Same size of S, say. So, how, what happens if you have small B then, which I would expect it's the dual variable, it's a conjugate variable to to Q, the momentum transfer. So. T uh, is uh, no. Our integral run entirely over the physical region, where t is uh, absolute value of t is less than uh, than s. There's no uh, not not sure what the analysis problems are that you refer to. So so normal so thresholds are not an issue. Things analysis analysis well, are associated well, to production of uh, not to production yet, to initial states. But yet. The way we think about it is that if there are numerous thresholds, there will be things that are part of the EFT computable part. So you would have to, you would have to make sure that if you try, for example, you might try to take this uh, this contour here, that's some large arc. In practice, to compute it in the low energy, you might want to deform it, and then you would have to, uh, when you do the EFT calculate EFT perturbative calculation, you would have to think about these thresholds, but. It does not affect the UV part of the of the problem, which is what we're, we're focusing so, so on. So you're claiming that there is in the large radius region, there is no non-analyticity. That, uh, that's our assumption, yeah. OK, yeah. No, but the, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to understand the motivation. I mean, if, if the, the motivation, yeah, if, the argument if, for the. For the yeah, as, as far as I understand, there's a number of thresholds always like IR effects. If, 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 someone, if someone could give an example where there's really okay. an UV effect, that would be interesting. But, but as far as I know, is that there are always IR effects. Okay, thanks. Any further questions? Can I have a question? Simone, um, could you please one more time summarize uh, in the case if I include the logs in my effective action? For yes. example, if I have the term G4 S to the 4, the one you bound, yeah. and suppose I add something like S to the 4 log of minus S. Yes. Right, so uh, how would you proceed in this situation if I really want to put the bound on G four? Yeah, so so again, it, we're starting back to this thing that uh, the we're defining couplings that are rebounding coupling. Sorry, we are bounding couplings 
that are defined in what will look like a very artificial way to a normal person. So, so to give the simple example, uh, in, in this case here, uh, sorry, uh, if you define G4 to be integral of ds over S5 over an arc at S equal M4, uh, sorry, at S equal M squared, if you define it like this, the fact that there's a log is completely irrelevant to your life, right? We're not defining coupling as Taylor series around zero. But our definition of coupling may not be the one you would like to know the answer in terms of. Right. So the point is that the, yeah, the, there is a definition of couplings in which this story is simple, but it, it, it's just not the one we want. You want. You you basically telling me uh, try to redefine your coupling G four in such a way that you absorb being the log. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, so is that, and that's that, a de yeah, and that and that's a definition you can think of as a way of defining G four at the scale m, and then you might want to convert this definition to a different scheme, which is a perturbative calculation. I see. And and are trying to keep those two steps as separate as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it, it would be nice to see explicit examples of this because right now we're just like saying words, but but that that's a picture. So I, I have another question. I, I guess it's an obvious question because one of the at three level, one of the most uh, interesting applications of this should be higher derivative corrections to gravity, right? Ah yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they are, they are all the ones we look at. They also satisfy two-sided bounds. I, I think all that gravity does is it just shifts shift, shift the offset. It, 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 uh, but right. I mean, graviton, graviton, graviton. Ah, the yes. bounds from the yes. chem paper, right? Chem yeah, money. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. This, it's yeah, this, this. I cannot, I cannot. Are doing this is this is really something that should be perfect for this technology. We developed this technology with this problem in mind, so let's put it like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Can I ask a practical question? Like, how yeah. is this going to be used? Like, for example, you mentioned that yeah. that your 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 theory rolls out weak. Uh, weekly yeah. couple TV completions of Galileans. Yes. Okay, so there are people out there doing Galileans. What is this going to be? How is this going? So they will say, okay, so we will be looking at strongly coupled TV completions. So your bounds don't apply. Is this going to be a way out for any model out there, or is this going to really kill some things? No, no, that we're not. The UV completions could be strongly coupled. But then how can you what, we, what, we, what we're ruling out is weakly coupled infrared Galileans. This is complete. This is ruled out period. And if you have strongly coupled infrared Galileans, then then at some level you don't really know what you're talking about because because uh, like what does it mean to have a lower uh, strongly coupled low energy carry? Yeah. So you claim you you ruled out weakly coupled. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter whether, I mean, think of it like this. It, it, it doesn't matter whether, I mean, the, we're assuming a cutoff, but if the physics is strong, is too strongly coupled to the cutoff to your, to your taste, just lower your cutoff by a factor of 10, and then the loops are suppressed by a factor of 100, then you're happy. Okay, just assuming that some cutoff exists but it is enough to uh, it just, I mean, it's an effective, it's an iron effective theory where the higher, the higher derivative terms uh, 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 dominate. So, so, so we rule out the possibility of having this low energy effective theory. It's, it's, a, it's an effective theory that's weakly coupled in the infrared and, and, and because of that, we, we, it's ruled out. So for example, okay, Galileans, you say you kill Galileans, but then people who work on Galileans will say, okay, but maybe the amplitude doesn't grow as a square, it grows a bit faster, and we are, then we are big in business. So is this, is this like going to like reliably kill anything, or is it just always going to be wiggle room for people to continue doing what they've been doing all their life? <laughs> well, I'm not interested in killing 
people's living <laughs> but <laughs> but, uh, but but i think it's important to have arguments about what, what, what we believe the measure of how strong your results are because if we like is there some definite conclusion or did you invent some game which people will say okay but we don't like your game we'll play in our game yeah well is it okay? yeah that, 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 I, I did quite uh, grasp this maybe because i'm not an expert but uh, I think uh, sorry. I, I, I'm not trying to attack you. I'm just trying to. Yeah, to... I, I, I think some people will always, in, in the context of gravity, there will always be question, people who question the assumption uh, that dispersion relations work, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why I try to have a physical argument for this, but this is definitely something that needs to be answered better. I mean, the physical intuition behind this is that. You should not be able to send a single file faster than light. So there should be a sense that even in gravity, you can think about, you know, we don't have local operators, but there should be a sense that some kind of measurements commute with each other when they're space like. And, and if you can make this sentence precise, then, then you could derive uh, this, uh, you, could, you could derive this property that we use. So, so our starting axiom that, you know, m, m over s square converge. Is this is the statement that it's supposed to be the statement that space-like measurements should commute mm -hmm. in some sense, sure. and I, I believe it's really the most primitive and and robust thing we can say about gravity. Uh, it, and it, it, it's important to really make that argument more robust. But I, I, I believe it, it's, it's, it's a true and strong thing that, that have to be true. Okay. It, it cannot be fudged uh, around. Yeah. Okay. There's nothing else. Maybe, maybe I have a quick question. Uh, the the argument about positivity of small impact parameter it, it's basically purely kinematical, right? So well, in the sense that you could apply this directly in CFT, right? For for CFT correlators. Yes. Is that is that correct? Do, yeah, yeah. Do you, to, do you think yeah. do you think there is anything that that uh, could be gained in, by doing doing so? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. There are interesting things to be gained with that. Without giving much detail, maybe I can mention that uh, the special function a the special functions are different, and and, and in particular, uh, I mean having localized to impact parameter space physically suggests that there's a question of whether positivity at small impact parameters implies positivity at large impact parameters. It's not obvious, and it could be that they are interesting, like one over R correction. If you think about if you think about uh, taking ADS reduced to infinity, it it you know, if there if there are no if there were no interesting one of our corrections, we'd get the exact same story in flat space and ADS. But it could be that they are interesting one of our corrections. So so yeah, it's very interesting to analyze this, I believe. Yeah, thanks. Because our friends, uh, our friends from from uh, the Swampland, they really tell us that, you know, Desitter, ADS, and flat space—they are completely different worlds. So, so yeah, it's important to to study things accurately enough that we can see the difference. Okay. Anything else? Well, thank you very much, Simone, and thanks, everybody. <laughs>